Yay! I'm here to rev you up after your sleepy lunch. Your sleep-inducing lunch. Hello, everyone. This talk, welcome to this talk, uh, where we talk about whether SBOM for a cloud is even a thing. You guys are special because you get the disclaimer that says, I don't speak for my employer or the US government. These are my views. Uh, and you get your large language model fix of the day. Uh, this is something that I fed to uh, something called HeyPI, because that's the one that didn't get, ask me for my, asked me to create an account. Just said, OK, go ahead and test it out. Um, and I asked it, like, uh, if you are made of software, and an SBOM is a software bill of materials, shouldn't you have an SBOM then? And it helpfully re uh, replied, no, I am not distributed as a product. Um, so I'm just here to chat and help people out. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> Um, but everyone knows that large language models are trained on um, things that people think. So this actually reflects the way that generally people think right now, which is services are not distributed. So why does it need an SBOM? Well, uh, in this talk, we shall explore what that means here. OK, um, a little about me. I'm the maintainer of an open source project called Turn, which is a container inventory tool. It generates SBOMs for container images. By the way, I have heard that this is the only uh, container SBOM generator that fails closed rather than fail open, which is something that uh, I found out from a talk that Ian Coalwater and friends did at KubeCon. So in the talk, they showed that all the scanners that they were using for containers uh, said there are no CVEs, uh, even there are no packages. Uh, and they made it do that by like overwriting some files. So, um, but Turn is the only one that goes like, uh, I don't know what this is. I'm sorry, I can't give you any information. So um, yeah, so I am the maintainer along with Rose Judge. Uh, come talk to us about it. I'm also a contributor to SPDX projects. Uh, I've written documents um, under like with in collaboration with uh, CNCF Static Security. Um, and I have been heavily involved in the CISA SBOM working groups. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. Uh, Justin Murphy has seen me in all of the working groups. Hi, Justin. <laughs> uh, and I used to be involved in the Open Container Initiative um, artifacts and reference, like reference types work that you may have heard of if you were listening to the keynotes this morning. Um, so I, contribu I contributed to that a little bit, uh, but there's so much SBOM work going on right now that I had to step away. Okay, story time. Uh, some years ago, uh, 2021 was not a good year for software supply chain security stuff. So in December 2020, there was the sunburst attack that got everyone all uh, upset. Uh, somewhere around May, uh, anyone who's involved in SBOM may have remembered this whole string of letters and numbers, EO14028, repeat after me. Uh, no, don't. <laughs> so um, that's when the US government uh, released their executive order that said that all the suppliers have to give them uh, an SBOM. A uh, couple of months later, there was, uh, they released documentation on what the minimum SBOM elements look like, so people can actually start generating 
these S-bombs. And then for a little while, nothing really happened. And then all of a sudden in December, a zero day called log four shell came out and then everyone started panicking all over again. Uh, somewhere uh, in the middle, people were running around trying to fix this. It's like there, there, there are companies that are still recovering from it. Uh, somewhere in uh, the late fall of 2022, CISA published that they had started off these um, SBOM work streams, which uh, tackled different aspects about SBOM. Uh, and l earlier this year, in April, they had published some of their findings from each of those groups. So these are the work streams that they created. Uh, VEX is the uh, vulnerability exchange work, which is talking about how to uh, communicate in a machine-readable way how, uh, uh, whether a vulnerability is exploitable or not, or what the status of the investigation is. There's the sharing work stream, which has uh, published the sharing lifecycle report in April. Uh, there's the tooling work stream, that uh, Kate's been involved in, Kate Stewart, uh, SPDX, uh, talking about the types of S-bombs based on the software development lifecycle. There's the, and then there's two other working groups, the on-reps and adoption working uh, work stream, and then the cloud and the online application work stream, which is the thing that this uh, talk is about. Okay. While that was happening, we've had a lot of uh, class, we've had this um, class of attacks that have been happening, which basically involve uh, attacker, like phishing attacks on employees of uh, service providers and getting the keys to the service infrastructure and then exfiltrating customer data. Uh, and so this, is, this class of attacks may or may not exploit a vulnerable component, but it is very much on the rise. Um, I'll talk about a couple of examples which are actually really cool to go through. Uh, let's see, cue the... Uh, what's the thing? Some music, what, the heist music from Ocean's Eleven? Or, um, yeah. Anyway, step one. Uh, attacker fishes a dev, uh, a developer gets access to their laptop, uh, searches for, listens for credentials, uses credentials to log into a dev cluster, and exfiltrates uh, infrastructure in for in internal uh, systems information. Step two, attacker injects malware into senior DevOps engineer's laptop. Senior DevOps engineer has keys to the kingdom. Uh, attacker uses those keys to go to uh, cloud backups, uh, cloud backup data stores, and exfiltrates all of the sensitive data. Um, what's sad about LastPass breach is that they didn't actually share that much about what exactly happened. Um, so we're still like learning things about it. So it turns out that LastPass does not encrypt all of the vault, it only encrypts passwords. Websites are still unencrypted, and that was one of the things that was in the cloud backups. And when you have like website information about what the users are using, they have the username, and then they have the URL. So you could create like a phishing attack where you you say something like, uh, "Oh, you've uh, you are, are you trying to link these two accounts, or you've lost? You verify this other account by clicking on this link. Um, so it's it's more the more information an attacker has about a user, uh, the better they can craft a phishing um, email. So that's the last pass breach. 
Let's look at one that is even more interesting. Um, let's cue the Mission Impossible <laughs> theme song. <laughs> okay. Uh, step one. Uh, malware is injected into the engineer's laptop. Uh, attacker listens for, um, listens for packets, steals uh, SSO session cookie. Step two. Attacker uses SSO session cookie to authenticate themselves using uh, GitHub's OAuth service. Okay, now they're in. Step three, use, um, now that they are the uh, engineer, they can, they have permissions to exfiltrate data from their data store. Uh, all the data is encrypted, so step four, you act, uh, the attacker, the engineer actually has permissions to create production tokens. So step four, spin up workload, exfiltrate encryption keys, use encryption keys to decrypt data. So this is like, actually this is pretty cool. A <laughs> sophisticated attack. Um, but the takeaway from these two attacks is that it's not one big thing that happens, but it's a number of steps that uh, exploit like basic uh, infrastructure sloppiness. So this is, it, it, it's, it doesn't look easy, but actually it's using like very basic uh, attacks that can be automated with existing tools uh, in order to take advantage of the fact that we do not know anything about the configuration of, these inf of this infrastructure, or even worse, you do not know what the service is made up of. Like, who are, who, what are the components of the service? And that's why um, CISA is very interested in the SBOM for the cloud. Um, so there are three subgroups under the cloud and online application working group. Um, the first one is SBOM for modern applications. This one is a little weird because um, this is more like bridging the gap between folks who are, who have, who are used to working on-prem and dealing with on-prem infrastructure and trying to get them to think about how um, whatever, in whatever knowledge they have maps onto services that are in the cloud. Um, so it's mostly about trying to find out what's the difference, like what applies, what doesn't apply. Uh, the second one is service transparency. This is a subgroup that I lead, and this is talking about, okay, let's not think about SBOM for a moment and zoom out and instead think about individual services that are talking to each other using an API. So we're trying to figure out what is the minimum amount of data we need to describe all these services talking to each other and what kind of data they're dealing with. And the last one, and this is like more of a vague thing, uh, is called cloud stack transparency. And this is more about how do we enumerate all of the, um, all of the pieces of the cloud stack that um, a, a application that you would be deploying onto the cloud would be interacting with. So all the way down to the bare metal. Uh, and uh, this is still a work in progress, so I'm actually going to dig in a little deeper about how this conversation is going about. Um, I'll start with our uh, consensus about how SaaS is different from on-prem software. The way I think about it is like the difference between uh, someone owning a home and someone living in an apartment. Show of our hands, how many of you own a home? Okay. Uh, how many do the rest of you live in an apartment? Or, you know, okay. Uh, so, if you were to rent an apartment or rent a, you know, or own an apartment, um, 
you are only responsible for the things that are in the apartment, but the whole apartment itself is uh, taken care of by like a super. Uh, and so what that gives you is that you don't have to worry about things like, you know, if the power goes off in your apartment, but the power is there in all the other uh, apartments, then you just call the super to fix it. Or, you know, if your toilet won't flush, call the super. If you're, uh, there's no running water, call the super. Uh, it, this is different from home ownership. Uh, full disclosure, I'm also a homeowner. You have to think about all of those things now. If, you're, if your toilet won't flush, that's your problem. So uh, the, when you're dealing with on-prem software, that's basically it. You have full control of your whole stack. But on the other hand, you are also responsible for your whole stack. So the reason why you know, folks move to uh, services or move their business logic to the cloud is because there are a lot of things that they just don't want to deal with, and they'd rather offshore it to someone else. So the, the difference is that you, um, you get convenience, but on the other hand, you lose control. Uh, from the security part of it, if something happens on the on -prem, uh, in the on-prem environment, then it's restricted to that on-prem environment. But if something happens in the cloud, there's like a whole lot of people that are affected along with it. So it's almost like if the if the super turns like breaks a does a breaker thing like the whole apartment goes out of power anyway. I'm, I've uh, extended that too much, <laughs> that analogy too much. So this is why uh, I would like to introduce you to a concept called the shared responsibility model. And what this means is basically um, getting folks to think about what responsibilities are on your end and what responsibilities are on the service providers end. And this includes cloud providers too. This is taken from um, the NIST uh, publications. And it's got like a, it's real, I, like, I really like this diagram because it shows that there's a gradient of what is your responsibility and what is the service provider's responsibility. Um, there are a couple of models out there that are um, provided by governments, like this is the UK government's model. Um, you'll see that there are some that are clearly in uh, the provider's responsibility and some that are clearly in the customer's responsibility based on what kind of uh, service you're using. And then there are some that are like grayed out. This is uh, CISA's responsibility model. As you can see, it's like completely different. Um, it's, there, are, there are more layers and different things are shaded. Um, and these are the shared responsibility models of each of the vendors. Obviously, they're all different. So the takeaway is that this isn't standardized. Talk to your cloud provider for a shared responsibility model if you are having, if you have a business relationship with a service provider, ask your service provider for their cloud provider share responsibility model. So you get a better understanding of where the lines are. So on that, uh, the cloud stack transparency subgroup works on tackling that shaded area where there is actually a shared responsibility, but we don't really know where the line is. So they are tackling this based on function. And so what they're doing is that they have divided the cloud stack into functional tiers. This is still a work in progress. So I'll talk about how y'all can get involved in this discussion if you have ideas or if you want to um, get involved in, or just look around. So they've divided each of the tiers into functions. And for each function, they are uh, trying to figure out 
the minimum data set that is, uh, that is required to describe this function. Okay, let's move on to how SAS is similar to on-prem software. Well, the bottom line is it's still software. So uh, it's still made up of things. There are still components. Uh, providers can be considered as suppliers and they can integrate into each other. They still have dependencies, so that means that if you're using a service, that service may be using another service. So there's definitely a dependency graph there, and there's still security concerns. So actually, in the SaaS environment, this looks very much like old school bill of materials, where you have business relationships and contracts with your suppliers. So just replace suppliers with providers, and you get a SaaS bomb. So this is just describing what that might look like as an example. So this is Netflix's um, services. Uh, and they use many different subcontractors. They, they have a good relationship with AWS, so they use a lot of AWS services. But they also have their own services, and they do use open source components, and they host them. So it's the, the takeaway from this slide is that it's pretty complicated, so, um, and all connected using um, communication channels, API calls, uh, network connections. So they, uh, it is useful for someone who has a business relationship, not necessarily with Netflix, because they're, it, they only care about end users. So this is like all of us. We don't really want Nest Bomb. But if they are using another service, then they would probably want this bill of materials of their services. So to that effect, we actually have uh, come up with a minimum list of uh, data sets. Again, work in progress. This is a list of things that we had as a community agreed that uh, we are able to actually provide data for this. But it's not the end all of it. Um, we're still looking for feedback. OK, let's talk about some use cases. Uh, where we can apply traditional SBOM, SaaS bombs, uh, cloud stack transparency things. So the, one of the driving use cases is, am I affected by vulnerability X? So you find uh, vulnerability in the news, and then you're worried, and you're like, oh, oh my goodness, am I affected? OK, um, in order to answer that, let's look at a very basic uh, service provider. They'll have an, um, usually you'll have a client that is talking to the service. Uh, this client can be a web browser, desktop app, mobile app, um, command line tool. They'll make HTTP calls to the service. So they'll make the calls to the API gateway. If that client had the vulnerability, that kind of falls under the traditional SBOM. So it's a physical, I mean, it, it, it's a tangible thing that you can go and poke at and introspect. So that's not a problem. And that's probably something that a service provider can give you. Um, now, if the vulnerability is on the service provider side and in one of their service software, this is a little tricky because you don't actually know whether your network call is going to take advantage of that vulnerability. Uh, it's very possible that that vulnerability is existing in the software, but it's mitigated or it's not even used because the network calls just never touch it. So this is why um, rather than saying like, OK, I want the SBOM for your control plane, you would ask, you know, hey, does my API gateway talk to, does your API gateway 
talk to that vulnerability or touch that vulnerability and you can say no. Um, so the second use case is, am I affected by a service compromise? This is very, this is something that is um, like very uh, common, a common question that gets asked because a lot of times when you're talking, when you're using a service, that service may use some service, other service to perform a certain function. Very typical one is an identity provider. So the identity provider might be compromised, um, but as someone who uses that service, you may want to know whether the identity provider is you know, something that the direct service may provide or whether they're offshoring it to uh, some other service. So very much like a, a typical bill of materials where you have contracts with suppliers. So suppliers are providers here. The last use case, and this is like a little tricky because it goes into GDPR territory and I don't really want to talk about that because I don't know anything about it, um, is who has access to my data? So when, when you have many folks that are accessing the same uh, service, you want to make sure or you want to ask the question to the service provider that whether there is uh, an appropriate amount of isolation between your data and everybody else's data. Uh, and in order to ask that question, you probably want to know whether uh, that service is using another service with data that is shared. Um, and so that's where like a SaaS bomb along with the cloud st uh, stack transparency work would help um, because it could it could be within the same service, the, the same infrastructure even, uh, and that infrastructure is not very well isolated. So it's kind of like um, threat modeling, uh, but rather than sitting down in a room, in a meeting room and having a conversation, uh, the service provider gives you a data sheet to start with, and then you further ask questions based on that data sheet. And, and that's what we are trying to get to in these conversations that we're having with CISA, um, facilitating them. Okay, can we generate this data today? Eh, not really. So yes, you can generate SBOMs for all of these software components that are used in all of the services but they're not actually going to be useful because that's not what folks are, like that's not the critical part, that's not the thing that uh, attackers are using to uh, get to sensitive data. It's actually configuration, like misconfiguration is, I, I understand it is the second most common attack vector uh, for services. Uh, the first one is data breaches, but quite honestly, the data breach happens because of a misconfiguration. So, and this is something that a top level service provider is responsible for, clearly. The rest of it are components that they can use, uh, so they can set it up, but when they configure it, it's all on them. And what happens is that if there's not enough isolation between customers, then a misconfiguration from one customer will bring the whole house down. Uh, so yes, we can generate S-bombs for all the services, but they're not gonna be useful. Um, but what is useful would is actually some description of these configurations. And we don't have that right now. And this is something that, you know, cloud is trying to get a handle on, but not really. So um, we usually, uh, cloud, uh, cloud developers usually talk about like, oh, uh, tools that can make your life easier. 
but organizations that use the cloud have to think more deliberately about what exactly they want. So the way that organizations adopt cloud is that they start with what, what their goals are. So you start with the people, you create, you think about what processes you need uh, in order to get to your goal. You construct policy that hardens those processes. You choose tools based on the policy. You create configurations for those tools based on the policy. And then you go and run the tools. And you have to do this repeatedly. Actually, um, Kate Stewart had given a talk yesterday. It was the safety talk, where you talked about how requirements are the ones that drive the implementation. Um, and if you do not know what the requirements are, then you cannot create like accurate bill of materials for what it is. The, you can't create bill of materials for these kind of interactions. And as a result, you cannot enforce your policy. So um, it's kind of like the, the call to action is to take a step back and think about you know, whether this is real, <laughs> whether this is really useful or not. Uh, it's possible to create SBOMs uh, in services. It may or may not be applicable. OK, so here are my takeaways for the talk. If you don't uh, want to look at all of my pretty diagrams, uh, <laughs> just look at this list of things uh, that uh, you may want to think about. So SBOM for the cloud is kind of a thing. We're trying to work on it. Not really. SBOM is a really funny word to use for this. It's really more of an actual bomb. But even bomb is not a good word for it. I particularly like data sheet. But nobody that I talk to likes data sheet. So I don't know. Maybe I'll make it a trend over here. Please use data sheet. <laughs> um, customers definitely want better service and cloud stack uh, transparency. Um, so service providers can't use that whole uh, thing that we're not, we're not distributed, so I won't give you an SBOM. They can't use that because um, customers will ask for it. Um, if you're using a cloud provider, ask your cl cloud provider for their shared responsibility model. Full disclosure, I work for a cloud provider, not a very famous one, but getting there, I hope. Uh, they have a shared responsibility model. If you want to use Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, you can search for the shared responsibility model online. You'll know. Um, I think I personally think it's pretty good uh, in insofar as explaining where your responsibilities are based on what you use. Um, but yeah, that, that's a place to start asking questions. Uh, you can apply SBOMs to any software that you distribute. Um, it's not like service providers cannot generate SBOMs for you. Uh, but it is touch and go on whether that would actually be useful for you. You'd gain any information that will help you from that. Uh, my opinion here is that uh, you need more refined information other than the SBOM. So a few more steps to go there. You can apply a SAS bomb. SAS is not like really a word I like either, but I, I'm very bad at naming things. Uh, I'll, clo uh, I'll crowdsource some ideas. So a service bill of materials, if you will. Uh, you can apply that for hosted services. And we're working on a white paper that explains how to do that. VEX usage becomes really crucial for services, simply because we don't have the tools to give any kind of refined information. We just don't. Um, even right now, traceability and observability is a thing that we're still talking about, because we can't you know, get a full idea of what happens uh, in the cloud. So VEX usage 
becomes really crucial just so you can say like, yeah, we're investigating this vulnerability, or no, it's not exploitable, or you don't, you don't even see it in the service that you use, uh, et cetera. So VEX becomes really important there. Uh, SBOMs for the backend cloud infrastructure, it's not a thing yet. But you can help create that because you can get involved in all of these working groups here. Um, these slides are published on the talk website, so you can download them. I hope the links work. If they don't work, let me know. I'll put my information in the next slide. It's the next slide. Um, Alan Friedman from CISA uh, kindly reminded me to put the SBOM at CISA.dhs.gov. If you want to join any of the CISA working groups, just send an email there, and they'll get you all set up. Uh, each of these links are to the meeting notes and the white papers that the group is working on. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much for joining uh, in, at this very nice sleepy hour. <laughs> it is a very sleepy hour. You can reach me on all of those social media thingies. Uh, special thanks to Alan Friedman, Bhargav, Vivekanand, and Ricardo, who's here somewhere, maybe not. OK. <laughs> so yeah, that's the end of my talk. So uh, it's time for q and I've left a lot of room for Q&A. Uh, so you can ask me any question. Yes, go ahead. Oh, that's a. Um, when, uh, when considering uh, for SBOMs um, for these cloud providers, have, what is the uh, expectation that they'll actually be able to give these? So a lot of the cloud provi providers I've talked to, they consider their, uh, that's everything underneath the hood is their secret sauce, proprietary. They don't really want to discuss it or acknowledge it. So well, how do you see some of the, these working groups moving forward to address that proprietary? Yeah, uh, so they, they are not obligated to share their proprietary secret sauce, but they do have public APIs. Uh, and, and they have documentation on those APIs. Uh, anybody can look at how to use those APIs. There are hundreds of YouTube videos out there showing you how to use the APIs and what client tools are there. Typically, the client tools are open sourced, even though the even though the services in the back end are not. Um, so uh, yes, I understand the fact that they probably cannot provide a full SBOM for the services they host, but they can certainly provide an SBOM for like a top level service. So for example, if there's a storage service that we are offering, then we can provide we can provide metadata for that service. So we can say like, yes, this service is a storage service that uses HTTPS with authentication. Um, you can, but they can't provide any information about what kind of data you're going to use because that's, the, that's, your, that's your side of the equation. So you decide what data you want to store in that storage service. Uh, there's, there's nothing, I mean, and that's all you need. Right? Um, you, what good is an SBOM in that situation? I mean, it's, it, it's a question that I'm asking. Maybe you all have an answer to that. Uh, can you pass the mic over there? Uh, you got me thinking. Thank you. Um, good talk. I'm wondering, realistically, we don't have build materials here. We have bills of services. So bosses, can we go for bosses now? Let's call it a boss. Yeah. <laughs> a boss has in it is um, what you have, ac have the ability to have access to. Yep. Potentially references to other bosses. <laughs> so um, that's actually what the service transparency working group is working on. Like. Okay. What, what are the data types that describe a boss? 
So kind of a related question. Um, so you have services that use other services that use other, it kind of reminds me of software that has dependency on other software. So if there's like a vulnerability way down here, do you envision the bosses being linked like we have links and dependencies in software? Um, no. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we actually talked about that, like, uh, you know, uh, dependencies of dependencies and how deep we want to go. And what the result we came up with was that there is no way of validating whether that's true or not. You can only go as far as, you know, the, the one level down, mm. which, yes, so that's, that's what we do anyway. Mm. Is uh, like even, even in the regular, like, I come from manufacturing, so I think about electronic uh, bill of materials too. And the way that um, like uh, reliability engineering works in that field is that you, you have a problem with one of the components that you know of, and then you contact the supplier of that component. You don't know what's in it. You just tell the supplier, hey, this thing broke. That supplier will take their component, that same component, do some analysis on it and say, oh yeah, this capacitor blew up. Who's the supplier of this capacitor? I'm going to go and contact that guy. So you as like the electronics, you know, the consumer electronic holder, uh, don't know anything about that. And you don't care. You just want to know like, you know, whether this is something that you need to worry about, whether there's going to be a recall, uh, how much of money you're going <laughs> to waste on this. So it's very similar to that. I think uh, he has a hand up. So it sounds like you're describing, I, I'm a consumer. I receive my application from, from a vendor who I've paid for it from. It comes with my SBOM that tells me all the random little components that are inside it. And really, it also comes with another bill of materials, which is every network connection that comes out of this application. Some of them are what we think of as services. Some are back to that vendor for you know, a soft service. Some are hitting the internet for a public thing. So it feels almost like it is a bill of network expectations. Um, and yeah, so it's the connectivity part. And the you can never see beyond the connectivity endpoint. So you're just like, I, I get a page from Wikipedia. It will be pulled into this application as shown. Uh, therefore, there is a HTTPS Wikipedia node in the connectivity list. So that kind of feels like where this is going. So is that called a Benny <laughs> bill of endpoints? <laughs> a bill of, of network endpoints? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. We're coming up with all kinds of nice, uh, like, uh, media-savvy hype names. <laughs> Uh, anyone have any other questions about this? Any concerns? Is this uh, is this overly scary? Oh, there we go, Gary. Go ahead. Any plans for standardizing the format for these services as bombs? No, <laughs> no Gary. <laughs> Ah, why are you making me step in this puddle, Gary? <laughs> there can be more than one standard. As long as, <laughs> as, long as folks are, you know, um, as long as folks understand what the use case is for this, uh, I am personally happy because um, in the end, what we really want is not not full transparency, but at least some level of transparency, so we know what we're dealing with, and we can make, you know, good decisions based on that. So, for example, I would I would really like to know if, you know, a service I'm paying for, as an individual, is using, uh, you know, is using a uh, third-party identity provider. So, if I was going to use, you know, a healthcare service to that the doctor is providing, um, I don't know, Zoom Care. Maybe Zoom Care uses Okta for their identity provider. 
and Okta, there was actually a data breach. Uh, I would like to know if ZoomCare is using Okta. I'm sorry, ZoomCare. I'm just using you as an example. I really don't know whether you're using Okta or not. Sorry. Uh, I would like to know, though. <laughs> Well, before my question, just shout out because Gary is organizing the SPDX profile meetings to try to explore capturing this into SPDX at some point. Um, so I haven't been a, like to those meetings. Uh, I've been uh, I've attended some, but I feel some of the discussion there is uh, clouded <laughs> uh, by the fact that sometimes it's a relationship between a consumer who is using a proprietary service, which is opaque. Um, but if you think about it and you move it, let's say internal customers, inside of an organizations where visibility is not a problem, you would necessarily want to have that link of service to SVOM, to the components of software. And, um, oh, I think we're, okay. Okay, okay. And um, so, but it is a reality that sometimes you will need to want that information from the outside. So is the working group tackling that problem of as an internal person in an organization, I want to understand if a particular request hit endpoints or affected services, while at the same time consumers outside being able to at least content address the same information without having visibility into that. Yeah, so let me see if I can summarize it. You're asking whether like uh, service providers themselves can make use of like the SBOM and the service stuff or, okay. <laughs> so let's say I have a, a service and it hits two microservices. And as time passes, I want to know which requests were served by a component which was affected in some way. Internally, I could have like a lake of data with all of those SBOMs. I can correlate the information and it's fine. But when I'm outside, I need to have a way as a consumer to get the, the exact diagnostics without knowing the details. And it, this is some, somehow related on, there were jokes about, ah, oh, I want to know the SBOM for Microsoft Office, for example. But if they, if they don't want to like share the details, can I still address some of the internals without knowing them? Well, uh, that's up to the service provider, unfortunately. So if they want to expose that data to you, and, and sometimes they do, like they do have, you know, the ability for you to have like metrics uh, and observability stuff, like you can instrument your services if you want to. Um, but that's only up to the platform that they provide, right? So for example, um, if you if, if you were using a Kubernetes cluster, uh, or, or you were you using like I'm sorry, go back. If you were you using the cloud provider's Kubernetes offering, so for example EKS, uh, and you were deploying containers into that, uh, they have no problems with you instrumenting your containers and your um, cluster, and they probably provide some kind of instrumentation from the Kubernetes side, but anything below that, they probably will not share with you. So for example, if uh, Kubernetes is running on some virtualized, uh, um, uh, virtualized substrate, I'm calling it a substrate, um, <laughs> if it's a virtualized plane that Kubernetes is running on, you probably will not get any information about that virtualized plane. Uh, you'll get information about the Kubernetes cluster, but not not any nothing below that, and that is determined by the shared responsibility model. So if you, um, yeah, so if the if the responsibility is on the the cloud provider side, they're like, no, no, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it, and we'll let you know like if something goes wrong or not. Trust us. Oh, got it. 
my question exactly is how do you trust the data that's in the SBOM? Where are you storing it? Like if I'm the consumer and I'm like, I want to know what's in Microsoft Office and I get this table of, of data, how, how do I trust that that's up to date? And yeah, how do I verify that? Oh, Paige, this is my favorite topic. I can go on and on about it. My answer to it is how do you trust anything? I mean, this is this is something that is funny about like the whole uh, question of, you know, can I trust this S bomb? Uh, and I'm going like, well, you're like all your services are based on demos that other people have done and put on YouTube. So I know you trust that. Um, but yeah. Um, Um, <laughs> so hopefully not, because SBOMs usually have um, like um, verifying data with it. Um, and actually, SPDX 3.0 has added some new functionality about verifying usage. As far as like checking whether the SBOM itself is tampered with, that's like an external verification step that you have to do. So maybe there's a S-bomb that is stored along with a hash. Um, actually, this is one of the things that, uh, this is why I was advocating for storing S-bombs in uh, container registries, because container registries use Merkle DAGs to um, check for integrity of each of the con components that make up a container image, you can use the same thing for S-bombs, or any other artifact for that matter. It actually provides integrity checking out of the box. Um, and then there are uh, tools like Cosign that use SIG store to sign any, art you can sign any artifact with Cosign, uh, and adds the digital signature to the container registry. So that, that stuff would be really cool to start using. Uh, but other than that, like, I don't know. Like, you got to trust something. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry. This, this is the last question because we have the next, next speaker. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming at like 2 a.m. Go back to bed.